So we finished uh, Tom Stoker's book, uh, which is uh, on climate modeling the way he thought it. Uh, not a lot of focus on uh, general circulation modeling in the sense that uh, uh, the land component was not discussed much and climate change modeling was not discussed much. So I'm going to add just a handful of podcasts from uh, David Nealon's book, which is titled Climate Change and Climate Modeling, which has a slightly different perspective. So we're going to repeat some of the basics just because he provides a slightly different perspective, uh, which is also uh, relevant for uh, introduction to climate modeling. So starting with his figure on the schematic of some important processes within each component of the climate system. We have seen this, but here it has a uh, few more details. So we have uh, starting, let's say, the top of the atmosphere with uh, incoming solar radiation and albedo creating uh, the 30% loss. And that energy is obviously going to drive evaporation and circulation. So hydrology, evapotranspiration, albedo. There is also high latitude ice and snow and sea ice effects, uh, which also affect the albedo. Albedo, and we have the greenhouse effect of the atmosphere with radiation going out of the atmosphere and back to the surface. And you have tropical circulation with deep convection, uh, the Hadley cell uh, that we talked about. So the more thermally direct circulation. Um, so in the ocean and the atmosphere, thermally direct circulation just means uh, there is air rising uh, in the uh, warm part of the atmosphere. So surface heating is creating warm air at the surface uh, and the, the air rises and then sinks elsewhere. In the ocean, of course, uh, the sinking happens where it's cold. Thermally indirect circulation is where you have sinking in the cold part of the atmosphere like the Ferrell cell uh, and uh, rising of the uh, uh, water in the warm part of the ocean, but that relates more to salinity and so on that I won't touch on uh, here, but you can uh, look that up uh, in an another course I have uh, Tom Stoker's book, uh, Chapter 9. Okay, so this computer, every time I upgrade it, it starts blanking out like this, which I hate. HP is not a good product, in my opinion. Okay, all right. So the ocean has the surface mixed layer where you have the heating, cooling, wind stress forcing, uh, evaporation, and precipitation also affected, and heating and cooling. And of course, you have biogeochemistry and you have the thermohaline circulation, so changes in uh, chemical composition and orography and so on and so forth. I'm just uh, babbling a little bit there. But anyway, uh, this is a nicer picture from uh, David Nealon's book, also looking at schematic diagram of the Walker circulation because we have talked a lot about the Hadley cell but the zonal component of co uh, of that is of course the uh, Walker cell. You have lots of warm waters and rising five meters of rain per year or the maritime continent western Pacific that air hits the ceiling and uh, Hadley cell is the uh, polar uh, 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 transport of the energy uh, sinking in the subtropics and coming back where the walker cell sinks over here in the eastern Pacific with cold temperatures, high pressure, but you have uh, convection or the Amazon uh, forest area, lots of rain there, which has a little uh, walker cell uh, ascend and, ascent and uh, descent or subsidence uh, happening over uh, eastern Atlantic and there is an Indian Ocean side of this branch with sinking over the western Indian Ocean. So you can see how the walker cell is. Typically we talk about the Pacific walker cell but uh, there are also other branches of the walker cell which are of course involved in the back and forth of the uh, El Nino that we have talked about. Uh, this is of course the schematic uh, uh, of the major features of the atmospheric circulation. So we have the uh, convergence zone in the deep tropical heating regions, rising air uh, expansion, cooling, 
uh, tall clouds, rainfall, and you have the Hadley cell with the subtropical uh, chest stream, uh, west to east, and there is uh, a highly wobbly uh, subpolar jet stream uh, which is related to uh, the convergence of eddy momentum fluxes and eddy heat fluxes and the instability of the zonal jet stream uh, related to angular momentum uh, requiring lots of uh, the acceleration of the zonal winds and so on and so forth. Same things exist here as well but they are not shown just for clarity. So we have westerlies, trade winds and so on. So we have seen these things. Just to uh, add to that, uh, Neelan's ocean circulation figure is also somewhat more uh, detailed in terms of showing the western boundary current here in the Kuroshio Gulf Stream, uh, Brazil current here, East Australia current here, and the cold currents that are going from high latitudes towards the tropics uh, associated with each of them, California current, uh, the Canary current, Benguela uh, current here, Peru current here, and this current is uh, slightly different because you have a current at the coast that actually uh, propagates uh, or uh, flows down the Australian coast because of the connection with the warm uh, Western Pacific which creates a pressure gradient that is able to drive a current against the winds but you have a, a subtropical gyre here as well with the uh, East African coastal current and of course the northern Indian Ocean is different because it has the reversing monsoonal circulation and so on and the southern ocean is different because of its channel configuration has a strong Antarctic circumpolar current which is like the jet stream of the ocean which has uh, a wobbly uh, un unstable full of eddies and so on and so forth of course the mechanisms are different this is directly wind driven uh, not so much uh, like the formation of the jet stream in the atmosphere so maybe I shouldn't use that term okay uh, so combining the atmosphere and the ocean so lower atmosphere has uh, this structure with warm surface temperatures cooling to the top and the ocean has warm temperatures near the surface with a sharp gradient the thermocline and then nearly constant temperatures down to bottom of the ocean so there is slow input of dense deep waters from polar regions coming down in fact the waters move so slow here that we cannot even measure them directly lots of action happens near the surface where the ocean and the atmosphere are exchanging uh, energy, water and matter. So you have exchange of CO2, oxygen, nitrogen and so on as well as uh, evaporation, precipitation and momentum going into the ocean uh, as well. So the surface layer is uh, where lots of mixing happens and vertically homogeneous region is created which is matched to the sharp gradient below that which we call the thermocline and the thermocline itself has large seasonal range as well depending on where you are. Just to uh, round that out we have the uh, North Atlantic deep water formation with the uh, Antarctic bottom water and Antarctic intermediate waters forming in the southern ocean. So heaviest, the wa heaviest of the waters are actually going north in the Atlantic under the North Atlantic deep water and of course the Indian and Pacific Oceans receive uh, the uh, deep and intermediate waters as well. Over long, long time scales, these waters are converted back to the surface water, or back to surface waters, flow through the Indonesian seas around Africa, back to the North Atlantic, and they also circulate here in the Southern Ocean before they are uh, converted to uh, heavier waters and uh, sent into the Indian and uh, Pacific Oceans. Okay. The annual average surface albedo is again uh, relatively low over the ocean, of course depends on the angle of the sun but the average is pretty low here as you can see. Uh, on land it depends on whether it's uh, snow and ice, so the glacier here has almost 90% or higher both in Antarctica and Greenland, uh, lots of snow and so on here creating high albedos, uh, deserts have high albedos here for example. Uh, 
the third pole uh, Himalaya show up here snow or Eurasia snow up here show up here and then various other combinations of forests and so on create other uh, albedos as well uh, just to uh, add a little bit on the biogeochemical cycles we have the natural cycle of uh, uh, carbon, which is the most important greenhouse gas that we uh, worry about. So obviously uh, there is a certain reservoir size in the atmosphere which is constantly growing. So this is already old. Uh, you can uh, divide it by two and that gives you the concentration of atmospheric CO2 in ppm approximately. So you have uh, land uh, uh, terrestrial biosphere taking up some amounts and exchanging with the atmosphere and the ocean doing the same thing with reservoir sizes in the ocean uh, uh, near the surface and deeper ocean being uh, different numbers but typically they are very big. So the burial rate of carbon is rather small, 0.2 petagram per uh, petagram carbon per year, which goes into the sediment, metamorph metamorphizes, uh, and forms limestones and other things. And the terrestrial uh, carbon cycle is de uh, quite complicated with vegetation, soil, detritus, and there are uh, rivers carrying uh, all that into the ocean, ocean exchanges uh, via gas exchange, in addition to photosynthesis as well. And there are various numbers here of dissolved organic and inorganic carbons. Weathering is an important process. Uh, and fossil fuel reserves remain here in the ground that we are digging up and burning. So that gives us the perturbation, uh, human perturbation to the uh, natural carbon cycle. So we have land use change, which contributes some. Uh, land uptake uh, takes some. Uh, atmosphere grows at about 165 petagram uh, carbon uh, there. Uh, so you have, uh, that's the uh, perturbation over uh, the 1990s. Uh, so that is 1750 to 1994 are given here as 165 petagram carbon per year. Um, so fossil fuel uh, burning obviously contributes per year about six and a half petagram carbon per year but if you include other things from land use and so on you will uh, increase this number uh, quite a bit. Um, okay so I'm not going to go into the details because we did some of this in the uh, first part uh, in the introduction to climate science. Uh, I'm just spinning this up to uh, bring us to uh, modeling climate change. So this is another way to look at how carbon dioxide is accumulating in the atmosphere. So accumulation rate in the atmosphere is a difference between what is being emitted uh, from fossil fuel combustion and what is being taken up by land and uh, what goes into the ocean. So accumulation rate in the ocean and land are put on top of what is accumulating in the atmosphere. This is different than the typical Keeling curve we've been looking at which shows uh, just the uh, uh, seasonal cycle dominating and the trend dominating. If you take out the trend and look at the year-to-year -year variability then obviously things like El Nino, La Nina, wildfires, volcanic eruptions and so on begin to show up in the atmospheric uh, rate in uh, accumulation rate in the atmosphere corresponding to the changes in the accumulation rates in the ocean and land as well. Okay, so that's just a, a brief orientation of uh, modeling climate change uh, using uh, several chapters from David Nealon's book. I am not going to go into the details in this book. I'm just going to use some key figures from the book to make some additional points to uh, what we already did with Tom Stoker's book. So there will be some overlaps, but that's okay. Uh, just. Uh, the emphasis on climate change uh, will come through here when we go forward, uh, including some details about general circulation modeling, which is uh, not uh, heavily emphasized in Tom's book. Okay.